So today I'll be speaking to a very special guest uh, that I've been following for a few years now, uh, and that's American YouTuber and political commentator John Doyle. So John, great to finally have you on to connect and chat. Uh, we have quite a few mutuals, so I thought it would be fun to sort of connect and have a, a good conversation. So uh, welcome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. That's the first time I've ever been described as an American, I guess. Today I am in the, the out group. That's, That's okay. It. That's it. No, I'm looking forward to it, man. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I think the first um, exposure that I had to your content was you were doing uh, a long formatted video all around the dangers of corn or pornography. We have to say that now because it's YouTube. Right. Um, and it was, it, it sort of blew my mind uh, really at the time because you read studies, you look into like lots of things and how harmful that is. And it sort of, um, sort of open doors to uh, basically like a giant red pill, if that makes sense. And then uh, I was sharing that around with with loads of friends, just getting them to watch it. And uh, yeah, that was the first exposure of like your your content. But um, for those who might not know uh, you from this country, I'm sure you're very well known over in America. But um, would you mind giving like a brief overview on who you are, uh, what it is you do, and uh, what subjects you sort of specialize in? Sure. Yeah. I, uh, well, first of all, to my brothers across the pond, I just want you to know, I have no, you know, performative animosity towards the English. None of this, you know, oh, I'm going to dump more tea in the harbor. I view us all as brothers. We have a shared heritage. So none of that from this American YouTuber. I have a great respect for the English. But uh, yeah, I, um, I'm, I guess I'm a very, you know, alarmingly far right young man is the way that uh, ABC7 in DC, I think, describes me. Um, traditional conservative, Catholic. I've uh, been involved in politics now for about five years. I'm 23 years old. Uh, didn't go to college, just been doing stuff online, doing activism, things like that. Awesome, man. And um, where would you say you would sit politically? I know people, there's, there's a lot of sort of, I want to say, because it's not specifically conservative um, mm -hmm. or it's not specifically just right wing. Is, is there sort of a, a place you sit comfortably that's in the political sphere, would you say? Um, maybe not in the political sphere. I, I think that I'm definitely in the minority, but as I continue, I think, you know, as things decline in general, it sort of pushes people to a point of anxiety where I think they're more comfortable accepting views that may have been taboo as recently as three years ago. Mm. Um, but I describe myself as authentically conservative, which is just like my rhetorical strategy of being like, no, I'm the real conservative. You guys aren't because, you know, you've got neoconservatives. You've got these like conservatarians who tend to be more libertarian inclined. Um, but I would I, you know, someone in the tradition of like maybe like a Pat Buchanan, anybody adjacent to him like a paleo conservative so to speak i would definitely probably place myself there i have that book actually the death of the west um mm -hmm. and it's uh it actually opened my eyes to so many subjects as well i mean he he talks about birth rates a lot he talks about obviously mass immigration is one of the main sort of topics that he touches on but he also talks a lot about uh, china and the influence within um, American, the American educational system and how that's been completely taken over and teachers yeah. unions as well. Like, I didn't realize for such a long time how powerful the unions are in America. I know you guys had the, uh, the Supreme Court ruling quite recently about affirmative action within higher mm. education. And um, for me, I don't know what your take on, is on this uh, just off the bat, but for me, with the the, the unions being so powerful over there, is that going to make much of a difference? I mean, what's your take on, on that? Um, the more cynical side of me wants to view it as a victory, or excuse me, as a loss, just because it doesn't really do much. It doesn't really have teeth. Mm. Uh, but, you know, if politics is a tug of war, I suppose any ground gained, even if it shouldn't have been lost in the first place, is still good. Um, the problem is, and even Harvard, I think, put out a statement basically like waving their finger about this. They can still de facto use race as a factor for uh, admission. And so the way that Harvard wrote about it in their you know, announcement was citing the text in the decision that said, you know, you can still take into account things like the racial struggle and a college essay, things like that. And then their last sentence was Harvard will be perfectly happy to comply with the court's ruling, basically saying like, they're still going to you know take race into account mm. so they absolutely will um because we don't have the power to enforce this decision like the court may say don't do this but if you don't have 
you know, apparatuses that are willing to actually enforce that decision is still going to happen. Um, so maybe it will be lesser than, but quite honestly, the the biggest way that you'd be able to tell that it actually was taken into effect is if all of a sudden like university, you know, incoming freshman class were like, you know, 30% Asian, 50% white, something like that, but you're never going to see that. So they will definitely still take it into account. Yeah. Um, can I ask, how, how did you become a Catholic? Is, there, is this something you were always just a Catholic or uh, how, how did it come about? Were you reformed? I don't know the answer to that, actually. So I was I was raised Catholic. I'm not I do not identify with the trad cats. You know, I sometimes I feel like the the Thomas Sowell or the Clarence Thomas of like the Catholic online because it's just, you know, some of the great guys, but sometimes they get a little larpy, I think. But yeah, I was raised Catholic and then I went through uh, in the mid 2010s what I refer to as my edgy atheist phase where, you know, you watch like a, like a George Carlin stand up bit and he's like, if God is real, then why does a bad thing happen? And you're like 14. So you're like, so true. Um, um, so I would try to, cause my mom would make us go to mass every Sunday and I didn't want to do that. And so I would like get into these arguments with her and she didn't really have an answer to it because she was raised Catholic as well. Um, and never really, I guess, got into the apologetics. So, so it's these like very basic arguments that me as a, a, teen, a young teenager had, she just sort of brushed off or maybe it was, and this is honestly probably true. Maybe it was just, she didn't feel like she had to justify this to her child. And so she didn't engage with me, but that allowed for me to just be like, Hey, I know everything. Mm. And then uh, I got a little bit older. I was like 17, 18, 19. I started reading more into it and I was like, Oh, that's actually ridiculous. And so then I came back to the church, but I was confirmed still. in I think 2014. Um, and so, yeah, I've always been Catholic. That's cool, man. Like I, I remember the stage is like, I was an atheist for, for 14 years, like a long time. And it was only like a year and a half ago that I suddenly, I don't know, had this strange awakening. I, I, it's something about post 2020 that's really sort of changed yeah. a lot of people's mindsets. Um, and, you know, I'm still very new to the whole uh, Christian faith, but, uh, you know, I'm getting there. I'm picking up my Bible, man. Like it's, it's excellent. It's really good. Mm -hmm. Um, Moving on, I think, have you seen Sound of Freedom yet to start with? Yeah. Um, what was it like? Because I, I can't see it at the minute. Like it, when we're not allowed to see it at the minute in, in the UK, it's exclusively for the US. But um, what's your uh, what's your take on it so far? I actually thought it was very good. Um, obviously, I support the message, but there was another movie that came out this year that was, you know, oriented for a conservative audience that was also very good but there were some things about it just because you know these types of movies don't have big production budgets like you'd mm -hmm. see with you know some blockbuster so some of the acting in this other movie was a little bit stale uh you know some of the lines were a little bit corny and so that took me out of the experience temporarily but it was still a very good movie i won't say the title but you know you can probably put two and two together this movie though sound of freedom is actually the acting is very good um the dialogue is very good and the story is actually true it's not like oh vaguely based on a true story and we're going to make it into this big dramatic thing it's actually a, a true story like pretty much verbatim mm. um and i thought it was really good because you know it's talking about the issue of human trafficking specifically child trafficking and it doesn't do this it doesn't fall into the mistake of making the issue out to be this very mysterious sort of like romanticized conspiracy uh where you've got like you know these elites and like elites partake you know with any sort of like trafficking whether it's drugs children like elites will partake they do have networks but you know the the bulk of it is just like existing in countries that just don't place a value on the innocence of children or maybe human life in general like we're used to seeing in the west so it was a very raw depiction of how child trafficking exists in latin american countries and you've got this guy and this was also very nice uh they allowed the white man to be the hero again which is something that's very rare nowadays unless he's like standing up for like gay rights or feminism or something so you got this guy who goes and basically quits his job. Um, this isn't a spoiler, this is just the plot, I won't spoil. He quits his job working for the United States government fighting this issue because they basically have him uh, like bureaucratized, you know, he's on a leash, he can't act in certain ways. And he quits that and basically becomes a vigilante to go rescue this particular child who had been separated from her brother um, because the dad comes and is like, what would you do if it was your child? And he was like, so true. And so then he goes and he ends up saving this little girl. 
Oh, I suppose that <laughs> you knew it was gonna happen. All right, it's a Hollywood movie. There you know what's gonna happen. <laughs> so, John Doyle spoils, spoils Sound of Freedom live. Yeah, yeah, but it's still it's still very good. Very uh, definitely well worth seeing. Um, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, awesome, man. I think I've been seeing some rumors online. People saying that theaters across America have been like turning the AC up and, and things like that, and turning the volume down because they really don't want to like you guys to see the movie basically yeah. um i don't know is this do you think that's true um just off off the bat because i keep seeing this everywhere i keep seeing people post videos of themselves saying things like yeah we went to this theater to go and see it uh, it was packed but then because it was too hot it, and we were so uncomfortable so many people got up and left because of it um i don't know what's your take do you think that's true do you think that's a real thing Maybe in some cases, but I also do think there's a big incentive right now to like, you know, because everyone's talking about Sound of Freedom on the right. So if you want, sure. you know, to go viral, you can be like, oh, my gosh, yeah. AMC is working for the globalists. And it's like, you know, maybe, but at a more practical level, you know, the people working at these theaters, like, do they really care? Maybe you've got some like blue hair college girl who's working there. Maybe she messes with the AC. But I, I, I tend to believe that's probably not happening uh, as much as people are saying. But you know, I'll say that on your show because I'll be more honest. But if I'm on my show, I'm, you know, <laughs> this is definitely having this is why you need to go see that movie. They don't want you to know this message. Maybe it is, you know, in 10 percent of cases. But I think probably what it is, is maybe you're going in there sitting down and then you're looking for any reason like, oh, you know, shoot, the, the movie glitched, the audio cut out for a second. And just this is literally George Soros. So like immediately <laughs> jump into that conclusion just to uh, assume it's some sort of nefarious intent. I think um I, I think now, post-2020, like a lot of weird stuff has been happening over the co last couple of years. We know this. Obviously, the conspiracy sort of realm has sort of opened up. But I think now there are a lot of people, including myself, that will see something like that and immediately connect dots that not necessarily weren't there. And I think we're seeing that quite a lot. But that moves me on to like ask you. I've personally seen this. I'm sure you've seen this as well. Why are we seeing like a predominantly, well, it's predominantly liberals um, and of course the liberal elite uh, and the media establishment. Why are they cons consistently discrediting this film and Jim Caviezel as well? Why do you think that is in your opinion? The average liberal, and this isn't like me trying to antagonize, but like the average liberal really is a miserable person. Um, not all of them, but the average. And if you look at like the way the founding fathers, at least in this country, structured our government, that type of liberalism could actually function for the type of people that existed back in, you know, the, the 18th century. The type of people we have now taking into account how, you know, their endocrine systems have been destroyed by the chemicals we have over here in our food, mm -hmm. uh, the way that like the entire family structures collapse, like the average person who's a liberal is not a liberal because they want that sort of autonomy that was, you know, promised to them, or they want that self-governance, or they want, you know, maybe even to help out the, the working man or whatever. It's because they hate hierarchy and they hate excellence because they feel personally insecure. I mean, there's a reason that they're far more likely to be mentally ill than people who identify as conservatives are. Uh, you can even just, I mean, look at like the person who is the most willing to invest in the cause, maybe the Antifa paramilitary unit you look at their mug shots like there's a reason they all look like that like these are deeply spiritually ill miserable people and so for them politics isn't really about doing better it's it's really about self-gratification with virtue signaling and then it's also about like dunking on the conservatives which is why these people will willingly vote for lower material standards of living increased global tensions uh pretty much things that we all know are like terrible simply because they have this picture of maybe their racist uncle at thanksgiving or maybe like you know the chad jock who made fun of them in high school and they just really want to get back at that guy and so they project their politics onto that so it really is just like friend enemy so if they view conservatives to be sympathizing with child trafficking all of a sudden they're running defense for that now and they'll say, well, no, it's because it's QAnon. It's because it's a conspiracy theory. And that's how they rationalize it. But at the core, what is driving that is just that they hate themselves and they blame conservatives for that. It's just it's just odd to me to see it. Like, you know, I've read 
like lots of reviews. Obviously, I've done a video recently, and I put it out on Instagram and and uh, and Twitter, uh, and on YouTube Shorts, where it just goes through these strange reviews. Uh, people like the Guardian, Rolling Stone. <laughs> you know, obviously, we don't really need to say much about Rolling Stone, but. Um, just completely slating not only the film but actually the actor as well and it's not they they don't look into the intrinsic and uh important parts of of human trafficking and obviously child tra- uh, trafficking but what what's astounding to me is not so long ago cuties was released on right. on netflix and they ran cover for that they completely covered yeah. it. Said it was fueling a far right uh, culture war and all of this stuff. And I don't actually understand. This shouldn't be a political issue, right? Yeah. Human trafficking, child tra- trafficking, all of that. That's not a political issue. But what? What do you think? Why do you think it's it's made to this political issue, especially in America, where everything seems to be quite polarized? Probably because the people who are more likely to support. Sex- children and viewing humans as objects are like in that camp right um, i mean things like surrogacy abortion uh they really and even their entire like view of how existence is is basically just to like maximize their own pleasure while they're here they really don't have a concept of the self that transcends like stimuli so i think that's probably it and honestly i think it still is just like they really just don't like conservatives and so there's almost this like double reaction thing where like the left will do something and conservatives react and then the average voter who is you know a democrat a liberal will gauge their reaction based on the reaction from the conservatives um and even you know at a certain point like we just have to call a spade a spade i think with a lot of the way that they conduct themselves on that side because for example with like the lgbt stuff no one is stopping them from hosting like a normal story hour where there's like a gay guy in a Vineyard Vines cardigan and he's mm. there and he's like reading like a normal story. They could do like a normal parade where it's like mm. this person's walking, but they can't for the life of themselves stop sexualizing kids. Like every piece, virtually every piece of LGBT cultural or political infrastructure in this country works actively towards that type of behavior towards children every single one and when you have one that tries to dissent like i saw uh, gays against groomers they're ostracized from the lgbt community so at a certain yeah. point we have to ask ourselves why that is and the liberals they love you know all that stuff so they run cover for it and we have to ask ourselves why that is it's kind of like if you had like a um, you know a nest of cardinals in your backyard and for some reason they can't stop pooping on your car and you complain about this and your neighbor's like well I saw a cardinal on TV who doesn't do that. Well, I, you know, used to have a cardinal in my backyard and they didn't do it. It's like, okay, at a certain point, can we be adults and just acknowledge that this is happening and then maybe try to infer some sort of motive? And I think people really are desperate to like get around that because the answer is like shocking. Like maybe they actually just like want to like eliminate childhood innocence because they themselves usually had like, you know, a poor childhood, weird family structure, something like that. Like you've never met someone who is willing to run defense for things like this or is actively like going down that path who is coming from like a well-adjusted background. Like they always have some sort of trauma and it really is like a form of vampirism in the sense that like they themselves are infected and they try to like carry that forward onto younger generations. It's like really just depraved stuff. What's interesting as well is, um, like I have some followers um, who are gay, lesbian, whatever, and they actually come out and say, "This is we do not associate with this at all." And there's actually yeah. a big backlash now happening against things such as Pride and Pride Month. I mean, we've just had the entire. I mean, it's just been chaotic from well, from a social media standpoint with everything that's being posted. Um, and me and um, my business partner for uh, our news outlet grit news we just went over uh to london to cover prize just to see what was happening um and i think there was one dude standing there with uh jesus christ died for our sins like one guy in like a parade for 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 like i think it was like 1.5 million people turned up for this huge parade in london right and um yeah this one guy just standing there with this sign but what was what was interesting is there were so many when I was posting all the videos and things like that and of this dude there were there were these um gay guys actually coming out and saying listen like like pride is just so messed up like we do not like 
associate with this at all. And I, I find it interesting that now you seem to see this Overton window shift that more and more people are starting to say, ah, this pride stuff is getting a bit too much. Like the average normie is starting to actually turn around and go, ah, this is getting a bit too much. Like, you know, yeah. we understand that at one point it was to do with rights being, you know, being together with people and not face discrimination, all this sort of stuff. But now it's being pushed into another direction. Do, do you see a similar sort of thing happening in America or, or is that for the birds, do you reckon? I think so. Um, I think that people are becoming more comfortable with acknowledging that the advent of quote unquote gay rights was like a mistake. I mean, legally in our tradition, there's no constitutional right to, you know, sodomize another man. Uh, there's no like right for two men to marry. Um, they just sort of discovered that in 2015, the Supreme Court did and like mandated it. And our country traditionally has never been <clears throat> in favor. I mean, even in California in 2008, they had a statewide vote on whether they wanted as a state to um, allow for same sex marriage. And they struck it down. So that's like 2008, California. It's really like very liberal. And oh, even wow. they were like, no. So this is really something that in the last 15 years, I mean, even Barack Obama, you know, he was the most far left uh, presidential candidate in our country's history. And in 2012, he was still running as a proponent of traditional marriage. Right. So this is really something that's happened practically overnight in the scope of our history. And I think that people are only OK with it insofar as they don't want to be bullied for not being OK with it. Um, but now as things are getting more extreme, like I said earlier, I think people are willing to sort of think outside the box and be OK with having maybe positions that are now more taboo or less socially acceptable because they realize what's at stake. Um, and I think the slippery slope is real and it's very easy to identify. And I always say that people need to be comfortable understanding that in order to get out of this abyss we're in, we're going to have to climb back up the slippery slope. I mean, you know, there's a reason that our country looked the way it did in, say, the 1950s. And it's because people in the 1950s had certain attitudes. And it's like, OK, well, if you want your country to look a certain way, you have to at least accept you might have to embody like the average opinion of a passerby in that time period, because there's no way that you're going to have these very socially liberal attitudes and just expect the consequences of those attitudes to not manifest. I mean, that would be absurd. Right. Okay. Yeah. I get, I get what you mean. hundred um, percent. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Trump and Robert Kennedy. Now mm. I I've, I've not actually seen what you think of, of Robert personally. Um, but yeah, would you mind going off and just giving your, your complete opinion on Kennedy and whether he even has some form of a chance and whether he could actually beat Biden in some way? I don't know if he'll beat Biden. I think his presence does do good. I'm not one of these guys who's going to see like a Democrat who has like, you know, some opinions that are good and be like, oh my gosh, this guy's like so cool. Like a lot of people were doing that. I saw, um, I like, here's another thing that's funny. Americans will insist that we don't like political dynasties. We don't, yes, we absolutely do. That guy's name being Kennedy is huge points yeah. for our electorate. I mean, we had the, the Bushes, the Clintons. Yeah. We love political dynasties over here. Um, and so I think that he's good just insofar as he's bringing issues to the forefront, which are very important, namely health. That mm -hmm. is probably one of the two biggest issues, um, immigration and health and health, meaning what we are consuming. I mean, we are like a deeply sick country. It's because of what we're eating, because yeah. of what we're drinking, the clothes we wear secrete chemicals into our bodies if you're wearing like these synthetic fabrics. Um, and as a result, we are like mentally ill and we're anxious all the time and people have to take prescription drugs and be constantly like consuming some form of like whether it's a sedative or an upper just to feel like they have energy, feel normal. And that has huge consequences for the way our society exists. And uh, Robert Kennedy is the only one who has actually discussed that. I mean, even Trump didn't touch that, probably just because it wasn't on his radar. I mean, this is the guy who likes to drink uh, Diet Coke and eat Big Macs, uh, yeah. three square meals a day. So... But it is very important. So if that can become more um, prevalent in like the consciousness of the average American, I think that'll be very positive, even if he doesn't beat Biden, which I don't think he will. Um, and, and maybe that's not even his intent. I don't even think maybe he expects to do that. But, you know, when you run for president, you do develop something of a national platform. Your network expands. There's more money moving around. So a lot of people run for president simply for that purpose. I mean, a lot of Republicans do that as well. It sort of gives you more credibility for whatever you tend to, or choose to pursue in in the future so maybe that's why he's doing it but i don't know he is a kennedy so uh, i guess we'll have to see what happens yeah i think i find him fascinating because 
on the one hand, you've got someone actually coming out, talking about, you know, the vaccines, things like that, uh, big pharma, uh, lots and lots of different types of obviously corruption, the deep state, you know, all of this sort of stuff. But then he loses me when I hear him talk about, say, climate change, for example, yeah. and it just goes the other way. And then when I heard, well, when I read his tweet about affirmative action, when that was struck down and then he said, well, it's, all, it's, it's a bit nuanced, you know, you know, it's not. And you're kind of like, well, it's not really. There's no nuance to it. <laughs> and yeah. it, it sort of switches me off a little bit. But I must admit, the guy is fascinating in terms of um, whether he is some form of threat to Biden, whether he will beat him is another question. But his threat and his presence, I think you can kind of see that. What do you reckon? Um, I think they're definitely threatened by, I mean, he's polling very well mm. uh, from what people have seen just among Democrats because there hasn't really been a Democrat who has stepped into the ring to challenge Biden that actually could. Mm. I don't know that RFK Jr. could, but I don't see Gavin Newsom really maneuver. I mean, it seemed like he was in the last maybe 18 months or so. Like I remember he challenged uh, Ron DeSantis to a debate, which seemed very, you know, presidential, um, just about the success of their states because, you know, liberals will say California is great. Republicans will say Florida is great. But I haven't really seen anything from him recently. I think Gavin Newsom actually could. I think he's a very talented politician, um, even though he's a terrible governor in the sense that, like, he is not good at maintaining, you know, high standard of living order in his state. Um, but RFK, I mean, he is actually taking this seriously. So I think that uh, he might move Biden in a better direction in terms of his policies, at least what he's saying. But what I think is really important, like long term to view this whole thing as a victory would just be more people talking about those issues, more people talking about big pharma, yeah. prescription medication, our food being poisoning. I tweeted this out yesterday because I went to the grocery store and I got uh, orange juice, milk, two steaks, a dozen eggs, and uh, some turkey breast. And it cost me $70 because it's like, I have to pay a tax mm. to eat food that won't poison me. It's uh, There's yeah. all sorts of very indirect taxes we pay in this country. And that's one of them um, because we refuse to like subsidize food that is real. Like as you get food that has fewer ingredients, you are going to pay more because we're just poisoning ourselves all the time. And I think as more people discuss that, Maybe we can put some pressure um, on the right people and try to become healthier because, I mean, you know, a country's most important resource is it's like human capital, particularly it's young people. The average young person in this country is obese and yeah. they are depressed yeah. and they are probably like, you know, a step or two away from becoming transgender, depending on how much time they spend on TikTok. It's like a very unhealthy country that we live in. Um, and I think we see that reflected throughout all aspects of society. And that's what's most important. I mean, if you can't deal with the people in terms of immigration, in terms of the people you have here, are they healthy? Are they well? You have no future. You're going to get either eclipsed by a foreign power, be it China or maybe um, BRICS, or you're just going to like implode on yourself like a collapsing star. So it's very important to discuss. And so if Trump has to be the guy who makes immigration a household talking or discussion, RFK has to be the guy to make, you know, the, the health of the nation a household conversation. That's great. I'm very happy about that. For Trump, because I'm, I'm going to presume that as of now, Trump is the candidate that you would be voting for uh, in the next election. I presume. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that is correct. Could uh, <laughs> could you um could you explain in a bit more detail uh, as to why that would be your vote? I know it sounds like a silly question, and I know the answer, but it's nice to hear it anyway. Yeah, um, Donald Trump is the only one who actually provides opportunity for change. Um, and the reason for that is because he can't be bought. And that sounds like a very basic sort of appealing thing, but it is true. I mean, in order to get near the levers of power, um, this is one of the fallacies of democracy. I think, you know, we're told like, oh, you get to pick who run or who is elected. That's not really true. I mean, they choose to run themselves. You then have options to pick from. But the only way that you find out about these people is through money and through advertising and through, you know, connections or going on your favorite news programs. And by definition, power is good at preserving itself and it, it attacks anything that threatens it. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist anymore. And so the power that exists in this country, um, you know, maybe it has a little bit of back and forth on issues like uh, Bud Light 
or, you know, the woke stuff. And it's really good entertainment. Um, and while I do agree that the culture war is important, for the last 40 years, there has been a consensus that no matter who is in charge, Democrat, Republican, we are going to keep having millions of people flood into the country. We are going to keep fighting pointless wars overseas. And we're going to keep offshoring our manufacturing base uh, so that we can get like orange or not orange juice, like plasma TVs for like $30 less or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, this has all been very catastrophic to our country. So Donald Trump comes along and he's not actually a conservative. I mean, ideologically, people say that as if it's like an own or something. It's like he became conservative to win a Republican uh, win as a Republican. But he himself is cut from this very sort of like old stock American uh, American cloth. Guys like, you know, Mel Gibson, Vince McMahon, Donald Trump, Dana White, like these guys all represent like a very sort of like you know, old school Americana that we just don't really see anymore. Um, And so Donald Trump actually presents that opportunity because he can win an election because he's a household name. He has billions of dollars that he could, you know, put up if he if he chose to go that way. Um, These other guys, they are not household names. They don't have the charisma that Trump has. They don't have the sort of gravitas that Trump has. So if they're going to win an election, they're going to have to get into bed with people who are not good, people who you know have that money and have that willingness to put it up for these candidates because they want favors, they want patronage. And most times that comes at the expense of the American people. So um, and Donald Trump, you know, this is probably his last election. I can't imagine him running in 2028 if he doesn't win. And so it has to be Trump because he's the only one that can really make things. And it's not even just Trump. It's the people that surround Trump, the sort of like personnel issues that you had, you know, in the first administration have largely been corrected behind the scenes. Uh, I have on pretty good authority. I know a lot of the people who are sort of like in that orbit, very good people. These are like very based guys, so to speak. They're nationalists. They care about putting their country first. Those types of people are not attracted to a DeSantis administration or a uh, Tim Scott administration because they understand sort of the stakes that we have right now. And, you know, DeSantis might be a good governor. He might cut taxes. He might do things like that. But ultimately, Donald Trump single handedly changed the way that we discuss issues like immigration, issues like foreign policy. You know, he literally got on stage and told Jeb Bush that the towers came down under his brother. I mean, he destroyed the Clinton political dynasty. He destroyed the Bush political dynasty just by being like funny and honest. And honestly, like just on that alone, he deserves it because at this stage of like American politics, I view him as a truly revolutionary figure. I mean, he is the reason that we are discussing the issues that we are. And if it weren't for him, we would just be like, you know, President Mitt Romney discussing why we need a flat tax, things like that. Things that don't have as much, you know, consequence as the issues that Trump brought to the center of the discussion. So simply by that alone, honestly, if he wants it, I think it should be his. I think that he deserves it. I think that he's earned it. What's, uh, what's your take on when people say, because I've, I've had a lot of people come to me when I say that actually, you know, I would back Trump if I was American. Um, but a lot of people have said things like, well, he, you know, he's part of the game. He's he's part of the deep state. You know, he wouldn't have gotten so far if he if he was doing his if he was um, sorry, if he was if he wasn't part of the deep state and all this sort of stuff. And that he's in collaboration with them um, and Operation Warp Speed and all of that sort of stuff. What's um, what's your take on, on when people say things like that? I don't know. I think that they genuinely thought that they were going to win in 2016. Um, And I think I had even heard, and this is like, I can't prove this, but I heard from a couple people who would know that what they did in 2020, they were going to do in 2016. But then there was a country who actually intercepted uh, that type of fortification and allowed Trump to win because they thought it would be beneficial to them. Um, And then this ended up getting blamed on Russia, but it wasn't Russia. Uh, And so I think that's why Hillary Clinton even said to Trump, like, you know, afterwards, like, you know, you didn't win, you know, and they were saying it was stolen because they thought like this is in the bag. This is a shoe in Mm -hmm. Um, with Operation Warp Speed. I really don't take a lot. um, I don't I don't get angry at Trump for that, because you kind of have to think, like, what else was he supposed to do? Because the vaccine was going to come out anyways. And people also forget, like now, because we have this hindsight bias, how much anxiety there was about covid during that time republican voters like baby boomers thought that covid was a real thing we thought it was this big bioweapon released by the the chinese communists like 
there was a lot of anxiety about that. So this guy's going into his next election. And, you know, if he doesn't do the vaccine, then all of a sudden it's going to be, oh, Donald Trump didn't want to take care of people, blah, blah, blah. And so I think that he made a call. I don't know if it was the right call, but I honestly don't know if there's a way to win that situation because, okay, let's say he doesn't do the vaccine. Okay. Well, now they have longer to develop it, make it more uh, safe and effective. And then it gets released anyways. And also, and this is like kind of, you know, a callous take, but I don't know a single Trump supporter who actually got it. Well, okay, that's not true, but most of them didn't. So people are like, oh, you know, he did the vaccine. It's like, well, then don't get it. And it's like lots of people made lots of sacrifices to avoid getting it. Um, I'm pretty so, sure. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that he did turn around and say that it's it's your choice. I'm pretty sure that he said yeah. something along the lines of it's up to you whether you want to get it. Yeah. He didn't mandate it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, no, that that was all, you know, the state governments who were shutting down, who were like participating in this. He had no power to do so. And, you know, his working with Anthony Fauci, I think that it was probably a bad call. And yeah. the thing is, though, nobody else would have made a call that would have been significantly better. I mean, if you're going to tell me that like Ron DeSantis or some other establishment Republican character would have been in there and would have stood up to the deep state and Fauci and Big Pharma. Are you kidding me? Mm. Like, so if, if Trump did a bad job, realistically, that is still like best case scenario. I mean, you're talking about a global conspiracy. No one man is going to be able to act in a way that would withstand that. So if Trump did a bad job, there's no way that wasn't still best case scenario. I mean, there's no way that he could have seriously maneuvered to get all of us out of that situation. They would have just assassinated him if that were the case. Mm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point because, you know, a lot of people try and try and say to me, um, I, I don't know, man. Like it's it's really really difficult because I understand the whole Operation Warp Speed. I know I understand that it was bad and the whole rhetoric surrounding it, saying Godfather of the vaccine, you know, all of that stuff. But to me, to me, when he says that sort of thing, it's just his showmanship coming out. It's yeah. like it's like when he went to the World Economic Forum, right? And before he made that big speech, um, saying that he won't. Um, along the lines of not listening to the prophets of doom and, and, and stuff like that. And there was a video that got released coincidentally um, in the last like year and a half of him with Klaus Schwab. And right. he was like shaking hands with him and saying, you know, he's a great guy, blah, blah. I took that as he was showing him up that it was almost like showmanship because that's what, yeah. that's what we know of Trump, right? That's, that's all we know is he he won he wins up. I mean, what other president goes to North Korea and meets right. with King Jong Un um, and makes him step over the border? Like no nobody does that. I've no I've never seen anyone do something quite like that. So to me, it's showmanship as opposed to working with the deep state or anything like that. I mean, do you reckon that's fair? I think that's absolutely fair. I think one of the most harmful things about the conspiracy theory rhetoric mm. is that it didn't actually like train people to take something and assess it and do research. It trained people to immediately dismiss it. Sure. So maybe before they were accepting everything that they were told. Now they're questioning everything that they were told and they have no ability to just like take something and think, okay, maybe this is corrupt. Maybe this is connected. Maybe it's not. And so conservatives are like children because they see the world economic form it's like a stupid think tank okay it's like and so it's a very convenient like james bond villain where klaus schwab is going to take over the world and it's like and so then trump goes and he shakes his hand trumps in on it the world economic form world leaders go there they talk about the state of the country things like that do you think that the meetings that they're having that really matter are out in public like that obviously not also do you think any of the people really there have that kind of power like no the people who have the power are not public figures they're not going to these events and talking about you know the state of the world and where things are headed it's just like a very convenient villain because it is like a james bond thing where it's like you've got what is it uh uh oh shoot the octopus organization whatever and james bond it's like oh all these people are coming together and they're going to take over the world and it gets us all riled up and it's you know easy to point fingers at but i don't think that's like where the real problem is and i think that's uh it's just a misunderstanding of politics too like you know these people are important people to be around to me what is trump supposed to do be like no i'm not going to go no i'm not going to play ball like that's just not how it works that's so interesting because um i do a lot of research in the world economic forum and, you know, I, I look into the organization and see their ties with the United Nations. I went to Davos to do reporting, um, obviously 
I was with Rebel News at the time, so when we went over, it was like a band of journalists just trying to like doorstep the the elite basically and try to ask yeah. them questions. Um, that's really interesting. We might not actually ag- agree then in in that respect because I I think personally, this is just my opinion after you know looking into them. I think I think with their power and influence uh, as an NGO and how how they're managing to tie themselves in with the United Nations. I know they don't have say on policy as such, but they have the influence, right? They have all these conglomerates of uh, the biggest businesses in the world, biggest corporations from Meta um, to, to, of course, lots of other ones. Yeah, great. I can't think of (laughs) something other than Meta, for crying out loud, but still. Um, I don't know, man. I, I Personally, I think that the World Economic Forum um, is is one of the biggest threats, personally. Um, well, I think, yeah, opinion. that's fair. I don't think it's anything to scoff at. That, that was a little bit of a just venting frustration because <laughs> I don't think that it meets the level of, like, you know, N64 final boss, big glowing target, <laughs> you got to hit it, that a lot of conservatives think. But right. I like to focus more inward because I think, like, okay, if we have American leaders, we have, you know, business leaders who are taking orders or being influenced by the World Economic Forum, mm. that's a big problem domestically, like on our own soil that we need to sort out. Um, because if not the World Economic Forum, then it would be something else. Then it would be some sort of like sh- uh, shady backdoor organization or something. So that's always going to exist. It's kind of like when conservatives get angry at China. Right. And it's like, well, China's acting in their best interest. I can't be mad at that. I'm mad that our leaders are enabling that and that our leaders are taking these bribes and facilitating our own destruction because they're going to personally profit off of it. So um, I guess and it, it is maybe this sort of like patriotic impulse, too. I noticed that in America, we are always looking for some sort of villain, whether it's the Russians, whether it's the World Economic Forum, whether it's, um, you know, any anything but our own leaders. And when we do right. get mad at our own leaders, it's because of like, tyranny or something like that it's never really like a substantive mature criticism it's always very like saturday morning cartoon-esque okay um what what do you know what what's do you know much about like the great reset and all of that type of stuff like what is it what is enough it, you know? um do you mind me asking like um what's your take on that i i know i think i pre- pretty much have a solid grasp of what your what your views are on like the wef and all of that sort of stuff but um yeah, what's what's your take on on that? Just out. Of I hear so I hear the Great Reset used as um, this almost all encompassing vocab term for most things that are happening that are bad. Okay. To my knowledge, that was used to it was like um like a like a policy articulation or something about like you know twenty thirty um, and they would have like a total economic reset on the way that our government or not government like our world economy operates in terms of the currencies we use the way that we can exchange you know goods and services with each other the way that people are able to purchase property purchase anything at all whether things would be owned or they would be leased indefinitely things like that is that more or less correct yeah i think it's it's a it's almost like an idea that was bred from um klaus schwab and within the world economic forum where they're looking to almost reset uh, lots of different aspects of our lives, whether it be economics, um, whether it be environmentalism. They talk a lot about uh, reinventing capitalism and, you know, stripping that back completely and right. paving way to a, a brand new system globally. Um, I don't know, like looking into it, and I've got Klaus Schwab's book, The Great Reset, COVID-19, The Great Reset, which is um, odd. I don't know, like, after looking into it quite a lot, and I, I don't like going down rabbit holes and and things like that. Mm-hmm. I think, I think it's best spent just focusing on key issues. However, I f- I do feel like the World Economic Forum as as a body that has merged with the United Nations and is implementing um, Agenda Twenty Thirty Sustainable Development uh, policies, well, influencing that policies around with the young global leader scheme you've got justin trudeau uh you've got jacinda ardern all of these leaders obviously jacinda's not there anymore but still um print oh well king charles as well in in our country um there's even talk of oh, who's that dude with the eye patch eye patch mccain what's his name oh dan crenshaw yeah, that's that's the guy yeah yeah people like that embedded within i think 
I think what's what's scary about it, and this is just my view, what's what's scary about it is the merge between this NGO and something as powerful as like the United Nations, who have extreme like power within not just Europe but beyond. And yeah. to see countries develop like for example, in, in this country in Britain, Boris Johnson, when he was in power, and this policy is still active and, and is still going to happen, uh, they're looking at stopping the manufacturing of petrol and diesel um, cars by 2030, coincidentally. Um, and this Sustainable Development Act has been partnered with the UK government on its website. So I don't know, man. Like I think, I think there's a lot more to it than what people think uh, or what a lot of... Um, uh, conservatives might think um so i don't know i don't know what your what your take is on that but um yeah that, that's just my observation personally i think that's true i just i don't know how much of a priority i would place on it just because like like the issues i mentioned to that are most important to me the two being immigration and like sure. health sure um like if, if we don't talk because you will never see a conservative in this country talk with nearly the amount of passion they talk about the WEF, sure. about things like immigration or like the health of the country. Mm. And so the way I look at it is kind of like, look, if I don't even live in America anymore, I live in this like weird shopping mall that's like a third world country. And then my I'm not healthy. And then my kids aren't healthy. Like we're mm. fat. Um, our hormones are imbalanced. You know, my son has 30% the testosterone that I have. And then I have 30% the testosterone that my grandfather has. It's like, what, what even is the point? Like, honestly, just like kill us off, do what you're going to do at that point. Because the only way that we could fight off something like that, because I agree, the deeper you dig, it's like, oh my gosh, this is like very real. This is happening. So it's like, okay, how do we push back against that? We need to be like strong. We need to be well adjusted. And if we're not on that front, like we can't exist as a sovereign entity, as a country, the people that we have aren't even capable of like making eye contact with a barista, let alone taking on Klaus Schwab. It's like, okay, well, what are we even talking about here? So it seems like, and it's not just the WEF, it's a lot of different things uh, that conservatives I've noticed like to sort of fixate on as sort of like this, you know, we're going to take out these guys and then like all these other issues are sort of like swallowing them um, and they don't want to address them because then they have to do something. They have to get off the couch and they have to, oh man, we actually have to like <laughs> take care of our country, take care of ourselves because right. you'll never get in trouble for criticizing, you know, the WEF, Klaus Schwab. You can do that on any social media platform. But if you start saying things like, Hey, maybe they are actually putting chemicals in the water that are making us androgynous. Hey, maybe we actually shouldn't have millions of people be coming in here a year because you can't sustain Western civilization with non-Western populations. Then people are like, wait a minute. I don't know if I agree with that. Even mainstream conservatives. I am no longer allowed to speak for a certain organization because I said that maybe we don't need millions of people coming here every year from the third world. Um, so for things like that. So that's kind of where maybe I'm trained to look at like, okay, what do I get in trouble for saying? And then maybe right. why is that? And so that's kind of just the way I view it. But I do think it is very real. Yeah, like um, like I would argue that mass immigration um, has been part of the Great Reset for a while. And you can take yeah. a look at, obviously, what they, they're posting themselves about their their sort of narratives that they've fueled with um, refugees and, you know, the constant pushing people from all different types of continents into Europe for a start. Um, right. And it's been, well, I mean, just take a look at France, uh, for example. Take a look at my country, England. Uh, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's almost destabilizing in some areas um, because of um, the forcing of, of different uh, cultures and, and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I get what you mean. I totally get what you mean. Um, I just think, personally, I think um, a, a body like the World Economic Forum is... Um, is problematic and weirdly so open with it. And you're yeah. right when you say um, that surely like something as big as that, saying all these open things, surely they're not the ones actually doing the bidding. And you're probably right. It's probably someone that we don't know. We can't even we can't even process who they like what they even look like um, because they're just so behind the curtain um, that we just won't be able to potentially, you know, see or even know their name, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I don't want to go too, too like Alex Jones, Bilderberg, you know, that sort of side of things. Um, but, you know, I, I speaking of Alex Jones, I, I personally think he's been vindicated from, from quite a lot of things. I don't know what your take yeah. is. 
No, we love Alex Jones. He's uh that's the thing, dude. It's so funny, is like they try to cancel Alex Jones, mm. but he'll go crash like any event that happens in this country, and everyone loves him. Everyone like mobs over to him. Uh he truly is a legend. Uh one of the best to ever do it, and he's still got his media empire. So yeah, he's yeah. doing he bought me a steak one time. That was oh, like really? one of the high one of the highlights of my career. Yeah, we did a show. Um, he was up here and doing a show, I think, uh, at blaze studios Nice. and I was in, I was watching. And then afterwards we went out to this restaurant and he bought steaks for everybody. Uh, he's a very cool guy. He's like one of two people that I don't know. And I remember thinking this and then it was real. I was like, I don't know what I would say to Alex Jones. Like, what am I going to say? That's going <laughs> to stimulate his mind. Same thing with Donald Trump. What am I going to say to this guy? Yeah. Uh, and so I, you know, I made small talk and I was like, I'm just going to like, just enjoy being in the presence of this like larger than life figure. I'm not going to try to talk to him about. So what do you think about this? What do you, I, my brain could not comprehend what he thinks about anything. Daily news, the weather. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the ride. Dude, it's probably going at like 200 miles per hour. Like thinking of yeah. so much, like the dude has like gone through so much in terms of media heat. Uh, obviously his, his court case, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So there's probably quite a lot in his mind. Yeah. Um, I've seen, I saw recently that you're on the Whatever podcast. And of course, yes. quite recently, you're on Tim Paul and mm -hmm. you're venturing into the topics of such as, such as like dating, how to be a man and things yeah. like that. And do you know what? It's, it's fascinating uh, to, to listen to. And I, I think you're, you're personally um, spot on not to, of course, blow smoke up your ass or anything like that. But um, could you give a summary of why you think men are failing in the Western world right now? Um, I think it's two things. I think it's one, we don't have any channel for our natural like masculine energy. Um, the way that I described it, and I think the, the Tim Pool debate was that men like to impose our will upon the world. And if we don't have a way that we can do that in a positive direction, we will either channel it in a negative direction or we will just try to distract ourselves from it. So if a guy doesn't think that he can go and pursue a meaningful career um, and not have a bunch of barriers put up in his way, not barriers that are real, like being competent, being disciplined, barriers that aren't real, like affirmative action or dealing with like some cat lady in HR who's mad because you're funny, things like that. That are Those things are very discouraging. <laughs> um, or barriers. Uh, so yeah, if he can't do something like that and think that, okay, I'm going to be able to afford a home, I'm going to be able to find a moral spouse, uh, things like that, then it's like, okay, well, I'm maybe going to be discouraged. And, you know, a lot of guys will still use, and this is kind of weird, but I think it's true. Like when you see these mass shooters, these people that go and like commit these mass acts of terrorism or violence, like that is sort of a similar thing. I mean, you're not going to see a woman do that unless she's taking masculine hormones like we saw in Tennessee. And it's sort of like the same thing. It's like, you're so angry at existence and you're like, I want to change it. I want to leave a mark on it. I want to plant my flag. But because society hasn't allowed for you to do that in a very positive way, you instead seek to do that in a very negative way. Or you are somewhere in the middle where you distract yourselves with things like video games, uh, marijuana, alcohol, masturbation, pornography, uh, mid women, frankly, on Tinder, just swiping like a robot. Um, so I think that's what it is because we just don't really have anything to really sink our teeth into. Um, the, the corporate environment is very sterile. The wars that we fight are stupid and, and without purpose. Um, and I, I don't think that we even know what it means to be an American anymore, let alone or be a, a Western man or uh, let alone be a man in general. And I think the other part is like we mentioned too, with the hormones and with what we're eating. I mean, hmm. you know, testosterone has been dropping 1% every year for the last like several decades. And we think that that just happens, but it's entirely because of the environment. It's because of what we're eating and drinking um, the, you know, amount of activity we have. Um, and people think too, and I've seen some interesting research on this. People think that as you get older, your testosterone just naturally drops. That is partially true, but it's not entirely because you just are older. A lot of it is just like the cumulative effect of lifestyle choices that you've made while you're eating, drinking, how much activity you have. Yeah. So yeah. And if you're not you know, you don't have testosterone. I mean, that is what makes you a man, like quite literally. And if you don't have high testosterone, you're physically like more agreeable. Um, mm -hmm. You're less concerned about things like that. And so it is very important uh, to have men be men because that is what sustains civilizations. And I think there's a reason that 
as we've been producing very feminine, relatively speaking, generations of men, the country has not been able to withstand things that strike us as very obvious. Like, what do you mean you're doing this? This is so absurd. Well, who's going to stand up to it? I mean, you know, the country is just not what it used to be on a very physiological level. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's why it's important to discuss. And, you know, certain guys like Destiny, uh, who's a very nice guy, very genuine, yeah. but he also probably wouldn't identify as like a traditionally masculine guy, probably doesn't really care too much about it. Um, I don't even, you know, think because that's the other problem that we we kind of got into. A lot of guys notice that this is a problem and they take it too far. They try to overcorrect and embody this like caricature of masculinity. Yeah. Like, OK, I'm going to smoke yeah. my cigar and drink my whiskey and I'm going to It's like, uh, <laughs> just, just be normal. OK, just yeah. be normal. That's all you have to do. Do you know what? To, to add on that, I find I find the feminist sort of side of things cringe, but I also simultaneously find like the red pill community and that sort of side yeah. of stuff this hyper masculinity you know oh we must like you said sit around having cigars drinking whiskey and all this sort of stuff and sleeping with all these women like continuously i find that all cringe and personally yeah. it seems to me just podcast views they're just like right. they, they it's almost like they don't know they haven't spoken to the average man, man or woman and you know like if you speak to like the average sort of married man, right, that is that has been maintaining like a good relationship for like 25 years, has got kids and you speak to them and say, what's the what's your key to success? I don't think any of them, both sides have actually done that. And I think we're yeah. in a problem because we're now, especially with podcasts. I mean, I say that on a podcast, but right. you know, the, the this culture now of having, you know, really sort of loose women along with these really sort of quote-unquote hyper-masculine sort of loose guys sitting there on podcasts and um, hashing out just almost fantasy like drawn up scenarios in my view um, where really these can't really apply to a lot of the real world and sort of the average person um, that that's my take I mean I don't know it's, it's been entertaining of course watching you on like on on whatever and i i watched the one with of course you and destiny obviously you you guys have been um debating and stuff on, on on these podcasts before and like tim paul recently i do find it interesting having like both sides of the aisle actually having like good conversation as well um i've watched destiny as well for for quite a while and I, i've heard he's a nice dude um a lot that i don't agree with obviously but it's it's nice to see actually people having a conversation but simultaneously yeah. you do get these i don't want to use the word extreme but you do get these sort of boundary pushers on like the red pill side and you've got these right. boundary pushers on the feminist side and it's almost like it's doing a disservice in my view i completely agree i have a strong contempt for that whole genre of content yeah it's crap i appreciate it insofar as like it can get views cool but it poisons the well because yeah. like you said you're you're misrepresenting both sides and it really exists as like this form of like almost like revenge of the nerds porn yes. for like yes. guys to watch and just be like yeah get her andrew get her <laughs> tell her that you know she's ran through and just stuff like that and it's like can, yeah, can it's we just so stop? cringe like i watch it and sometimes i'll have conversations with people mm -hmm. where i genuinely think that they're just trying to prove to me that they know how to speak English. Like the words they're saying don't actually have any meaning. They're not profound. Yeah. They're just saying words. Yeah. And that's how I view this content. Like I'm watching these guys. I've got the suit. They've got the yeah, fake yeah. Rolex, that's which is, by the way, I won't say who, but I've met a few of these guys and I, I happen I can to guess have who they are. Uh, I can a guess nice, who they are. <laughs> uh, a nice watch collection. And, and you can tell as you sort of like go through the process of like collecting nice Swedish made, uh, or, or Swiss made timepieces that uh, certain ones are, are not real. And so they've got the watch, they've got the suit and they're like, you know, I'm a high value man, which means that I get to leverage my high status to secure a woman who's not ran through you stupid bitch. And it's just like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, obviously, ob obviously yeah, everyone right. knows that if you're a guy who has status, you don't have to marry a girl that's ran through. This yeah. is not profound. Everyone knows this. So yeah. if everyone knows this, why are you saying it? Because it makes guys who are on the lower end of the spectrum, yeah, get her. And yeah. he's like, don't worry, little bro, I'll take care of her. And, then, and, you know, for what it's worth, I do like Andrew Tate. I think he says a lot about a lot of things that is very original and insightful. The problem is, and it's not his fault necessarily, 
It's everyone adjacent to him right. who's riding on his coattails, trying to ascend to his level. Because the red pill stuff, the manosphere, that was gone. That was like 10 years ago. It was around. Now it's gone. So Andrew Tate kind of incidentally brought it back. And now all these people are like emerging. It's like the insect pit in King Kong. They're all like emerging from these crevices now, coming out being like, I'm going to tell you how to be a high value man. Yeah. And it's like, do you think Napoleon ever attended a <laughs> seminar on how to be like a high value man? He was just excellent. He was just Napoleon. And that was exactly. <laughs> and no, not every man, most men, very few men will ever become excellent, but it is possible. It's not anything. You know, if you were born a certain way, you're not going to be able to choose some career path and become the best at that. You're not. It's just not. But you do have a certain way that you were born, you know, with your genetics, talents you naturally have that you can cultivate and channel towards becoming excellent in whatever field. Yeah. Like I could never be, you know, um, like an excellent songwriter. I just don't have that in me. You know, I just I don't know how to write songs. It's not a thing I know how to do. But I think I'm pretty good at what I do now, and I'm sort of climbing that ladder because it's mm. a nice inflection point between my talents. Um, so I think talent is very real, and recognizing that is important. And everyone does have something they're good at. And if you can find a way to channel that, I think you can become excellent. But yeah. uh, you're never going to be able to just become like Elon Musk just because you work hard and read the right Dave Ramsey book. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. It's just it's not. True. I'm never going to be Elon Musk. I don't know anything about computer programming. I will never know anything about computer programming. So... Yeah. I, I agree. I completely agree. Um, you know, I think it's the harsh reality um, that men need to face in the 21st century that there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of saturation within industry. Um, and it's OK to turn around. I know kids at school now are being taught, yeah, let's become YouTubers because it's the easy way right. to do it. Right. It, you know, to gain some sort of um, monetary fund um, and just put your face out on the Internet. That has consequences. What we're doing has consequences because we're putting our face out there We're we're saying how we feel about given subjects and not caring about backlash, stuff like that. But it does mm -hmm. have consequences. Right. But at the same time. Um, a nation needs uh, engineers, it needs plumbers, it needs carpenters, it needs people that are, are good with their hands, you know, that can really um, sort of build a sort of a nation up, if that makes sense. And yeah. it's, it's a shame that people aren't, it's a shame men aren't um, sort of encouraged to go into things such as like apprenticeships and, and stuff that where they use their mind and their hands more, if that, if yeah. that even makes sense. But yeah. Um, Dude, like, there's so much I want to talk about. There's not enough time, so we've got to, we've we've hundred percent got to do this again. Um, sure. But listen, thank you to everyone for for watching. Um, and John, wh where can we find you? Uh, and where can we find your content? Uh, the great people of England can find my content at uh, YouTube.com/slash John Doyle, uh, Instagram at John Doyle.jpg. And uh, I post regularly and frequently, um, several times a week. People are really enjoying the content. So, good stuff. Thanks again, John.